Welcome, participants, to the uh, 20th Knowledge Cafe of IPPN. Uh, I hope you can hear me and uh, the communication is is correct. Um, I have, my name is Olivier Cosset. I work in FAO, in the FAO Evaluation Office. I've been, uh, it's a great honor, uh, I've been asked to facilitate uh, the discussion uh, of, of this particular um, installment of the Knowledge Cafe of IPPN. Now, I suppose that since you are participating in this session, you don't need a presentation of what IPPN is. But nevertheless, um, I'm duty bound to um, uh, give you a little speech about it. Um, it's, uh, as you might know again, uh, uh, an initiative of a number of UN entities. It's primarily um, conceived as an interagency network. Although evidently uh, it's open to um, all sorts of uh, uh, partners and, uh, and other development partners from the academia in particular or government. And um, it's been going on for quite some time. Uh, today's session is the first of 2024. And um, the idea today is to try and give a little bit of a spotlight on a particular work um, uh, conducted cross uh, uh, agency, but led by the uh, um, uh, the NDP office as well as uh, uh, the coalition on uh, SDGs uh, um, uh, synthesis. Now, um, Anna Rosa will explain um, in great detail or in certain detail what the global SDG synthesis coalition is, but um, this is primarily the topic of uh, of today's discussion. It's um, um, therefore, um, we are, are pleased to um, welcome and introduce to you the presenters to this session, which, which include Carrie Albright, Deputy Director of the Evaluation Office in UNICEF, Ana Rosa Soares, who is Chief of the Synthesis and Lessons Section in UNDP's Independent Evaluation Office, and Shivit Bakrania, evaluation specialist in the same UNDP evaluation office. Now, I, I rush to say that I was myself at some point a member of this evaluation office and therefore I know the colleagues uh, a little bit. I've been I'm familiar with the material, but nevertheless, I think um, I'm quite excited to be here again and to be able uh, once again to have a look at their work. I think um, it's exciting work for people like me, evaluators, who look at um, the effectiveness or the efficiency or the, the results achieved by agencies of the United Nations in pursuit of the SDGs. But we thought that it might also have um, uh, a lot of uh, utility and, uh, and uh, raise a lot of interest for a much broader group than, than just evaluators. So um, before we go on, Make sure that your microphones are muted um, to allow colleagues to, to hear the presenters. Do use the chat function to ask for questions and share your experience and insight throughout the session. After the presentation, we'll open the floor for discussion. So without further ado, um, I give the floor to, I believe, Ana Rosa to start the presentation. Over to you, Ana. Thank you so much, Olivier. I did my um, best. I want to make sure. Um, okay, we got the right slides there, right? Um, so I believe Nadine is the one passing the slides. I can ask her to to move to the sec to the next slide, please. All right, wonderful. So welcome everyone. It's a real pleasure. Yes, uh, Olivier, my former colleague mentioned, uh, I am. Ana Rosa Soares, I am the Chief of Evaluation Synthesis and Lessons in the UNDP Independent Evaluation Office. I work, of course, very closely with CARI in um, UNICEF and other 45 UN entities, actually 46 now. But let me start by telling you a very short story, I promise it will be short, uh, to contextualize um, why did we turn to synthesis in addition to evaluation for the SDGs, you know, being an independent evaluation office? Why are we working with synthesis? 
So just so you know, IEO uh, alone, UNDP alone has over 6,000 evaluations in our artificial intelligence for development analytics, AIDA. You may have heard of AIDA. And we continue to generate hundreds more every year. It's a lot of evaluations. So our later synthesis on the partnership pillar is started with over 10,000 evaluations on the topics related to the SDG 17. Uh, very quickly, uh, the UNDP colleagues and then the regional and the central bureaus as well as the member states complained. They can't digest this amount of information. They have asked us very clearly, please cut through the noise. Tell us what works, what does not work, where, how, so we can accelerate this pitiful situation of the lack of achievement and even reversals of the SDG achievements. So we turn to harnessing the power of evaluation synthesis uh, and evidence uh, to generate what is now called leaving synthesis, which is not something static that you produce this giant report and never go back to it, but it is a synthesis that keeps getting updated. Um, so that is the goal of the coalition, producing living synthesis of the SDG pillars and together producing evidence gap maps to identify where more evaluations are needed. So we don't waste resources producing hundreds of evaluations more that member states and our own organizations cannot digest. Um, it was originally a very humble idea to work only internally with UNDP, produce synthesis internally, but then we started to invite our fellow agencies and then the development banks became interested Then the I IFIs and then it was clear we needed to involve all key players in the evidence synthesis world, such as Campbell Collaboration and Cochrane and, uh, and so many others. Uh, and we needed to do justice to our UN resolution to support country-led evaluations as we decided this needed to be a global effort. And so the Global SDG Synthesis Coalition was born. Next slide, please. So the coalition now, as I mentioned, is formed of 46 UN entities. It's co-led by UNDP and UNICEF evaluation offices. And for the moment, the secretariat is based in UNDP independent evaluation office. These are just a few agencies that you see there in this, uh, in this slide. Many of them co-lead in partnership with many others, uh, the multiple living synthesis that take place in each of the pillars. We also have multiple member states involved, very active as Spain, Ireland, Malawi, Panama, and Canada, and multiple others. Next slide. So the coalition, as I mentioned, is organized around these five SDG pillars, the Partnership, Planet, Peace, People, Prosperity. But why do we do this? Um, we really understand that focusing on the five pillars allows us to recognize the multidimensionality of sustainable development and the interlinkages between the SDGs. We know that all SDGs are interlinked. Progress on one target may act as an accelerator for another target, but we can also recognize that there are trade-offs between progress in one area, which may have detrimental downstream effects on another area. So conceptually, the pillars encourage us to think in an integrated, systemic, and harmonized way. Cutting across these pillars are the SDG principles as well, as we are forced to recognize universality, meaning all countries are responsible for achieving those goals. This is not like the MDGs very much focused on um, developing countries as they were called, and also forces us to not forget about a key principle, which is leaving no one behind and reaching the furthest behind first. The pillars also allows the different partners of the coalition to coalesce and to, to coalesce around their thematic areas of interest and expertise. So each pillar in its own way is a mini coalition as well. 
So it, it is about remembering the importance of evidence-based decision-making uh, in driving progress towards sustainable development goals through rigorous evaluation, evidence, and synthesis. So we gain invaluable insights into integrative, integrated policymaking with what works for whom and where. This empowers us to design more effective policies and programs to leave no one behind. I will now let my colleagues uh, tell you a bit more about the power of evaluation synthesis, something that is, to some extent, how we are doing relatively new, uh, and how this is important and useful for integrated policies uh, and what we've achieved so far. But before I pass the floor to Carrie, my dear colleague, I leave you with one invitation to join us tomorrow. Tomorrow, we relaunch the reformatted first synthesis of the coalition on the partnership pillar, the SDG 17, together with the brand new evidence gap maps. Um, the synthesis is quite comprehensive and re uh, very rigorous attempt to analyze a global evidence base. Um, but SHIP will give you a little teaser of the evidence gap maps today. This way, we hope you, you will join us for a full presentation of the report and the EGMs, as we call the evidence gap maps, tomorrow. So thank you so much. Happy to answer any questions. Over to you, Carrie. Thanks so much, Anna. Um, and thanks, everybody, for, for joining us today. Uh, could we go to the next slide? So it um, falls to me to kind of explain a little bit more about what we mean by evaluation synthesis. Um, and you can see this definition up on the screen. So some of you may already know that we have um, a cross uh, UN evaluation office group called UNEG, United Nations Evaluation Group, and there are several working groups underneath that, one of which is on uh, evaluation synthesis. And we're in the process of developing uh, guidance for colleagues across the UN system on how to undertake evaluation synthesis. So the definition you see here um, is adapted from, from pretty standard common definitions of evidence synthesis, largely research synthesis. But we're trying within the guidance to look at some of the unique uh, characteristics and also um, unique ways of doing evaluation synthesis. So what is evaluation synthesis not? Um, it is not a lit review. Um, and it sounds very obvious, but um, we often get many things that are labeled a synthesis, which really probably should be labeled a, a summary or something like that. So when we're talking about um, an, either an evidence synthesis or an evaluation synthesis, the importance of the word um, systematic really, really comes to the fore. Yeah? Um, we're using a set of, of core standards and principles that have to be followed to, to qualify um, as a synthesis. So just to give you an example, it's not something that's usually undertaken uh, by, by one person because you're trying to minimize bias and triangulate and get different people's um, take on, on the evidence. It's also um, not an evidence synthesis, so research synthesis, what people mean in the, in the big wide world when we're talking about evidence synthesis, because we're actually finding as we go along with the coalition um, that there are some really unique requirements um, of undertaking an evaluation synthesis. And we can talk a little bit more about that later. Um, and of course, many um, evidence synthesis, or just for example, a systematic review, often include impact evaluations, but um, there are multiple other forms of evaluation um, that uh, we're also trying to include within the coalition. So this became really clear um, as we were going along that the UN evaluative evidence was a missing piece of this of this global puzzle. It was really uh, potentially huge added value because a lot of the, the global evidence when you're using impact evaluations can maybe answer the what works, but we had this sort of hidden, hidden treasure trove, if you like, of largely process and performance evaluation. So able to help with answering some of the how and why questions um, that many of our um, member states have. Um, Anna already mentioned that the coalition um, really focuses on, on intersectionality and linkages across the SDGs. And I think that's a really important thing um, for the evaluation synthesis that we're conducting to be holistic and, and multidimensional. So we do sometimes bring in um, research evidence as well. Uh, next slide, please, on uh, some of the defining characteristics. So um, as you would expect, um, the units of analysis are, are generally evaluated 
connections. Um, but we have been experimenting with using and bringing in other forms of evidence. And Shiv will talk a little bit about the, the first um, synthesis we conducted on, on partnerships, which also drew on DNR data, for example. Um, some of the other sort of generic key characteristics, um, this idea of, of minimizing bias is, is really key. So I already mentioned um, you tend to have a team of people doing this rather than a single person um, so that you can sort of validate uh, different people's um, takes or perceptions on the evidence. The importance of quality assessment is really there. It doesn't necessarily mean always that um, poor quality um, evaluations will be screened out, but if they're included, then you have to transparently say why they've been included and, and the value that they um, bring and the fact that maybe they can't be quite so relied upon as, as other forms because we're not so sure about the quality. And then I kind of touched on another key characteristic there in terms of transparency. Um, so you have um, basically everything should be out in the, in the public domain as far as possible, that the aim of a synthesis is really that um, if another team were to conduct um, a synthesis on the same question, they would come to exactly the same conclusions because you've laid out your, your methodology in such a transparent um, and rigorous way that, that anybody uh, could follow it. And again, theoretically, it's the entire global evidence base, um, which again, when they come back to. So with this, the whole thing around um, the synthesis, you know, it's a, it's a formal uh, search strategy that develops a formal, and I talked about the 10,000 records, you sometimes have massive numbers to start with, which then involves screening down, your coding. Um, so it's it's quite a systematic process. Um, and as I said, so that it can be replicated. Uh, next slide, please. So just a key kind of key, a few key takeaways, I think, from, from synthesis. So a key message here, um, the sum of evidence is, is more than the sum of its parts. So what a synthesis can do um, is really often help you reconcile competing claims or findings from multiple single evaluations or studies. So when you're looking at the the wood or the jigsaw puzzle, whatever metaphor you want to use, the wood for the trees, um, very often you see new patterns or insights emerge that you don't see from, from single evaluations. So it can also help to identify um, inconsistencies or, or contradictions in the evidence base and as Anna mentioned earlier, to, to identify trade-offs, for example. Um, a key principle with the transparency is to make evidence more accessible. Um, so you bring, we're trying our best to bring all relevant evaluative evidence together in one place. And there are concepts there such as plain language summary, summaries and the evidence gap maps and Shiv will show a, a demonstration later. Really a key way of, of enabling potential users to engage with and play with the evidence space depending upon their own particular angle or interest. Um, Kind of linked to this, uh, single studies really only tell one part of the story. I think it's quite tempting in our own agencies very often to not even intentionally sometimes just to cherry pick the evidence. I know in my agency, UNICEF, we tend to um, first and foremost rely on UNICEF evidence because it relates to children, etc. So trying to bring in other people's um, perspectives and, and a, a more varied evidence base is really important. Um, and that's the same thing from a, from a sort of country level. And as I said before, you know, looking at this um, entire body of evidence can give insights into, into consistency, whether um, different evaluations are finding uh, similar stories again and again or not. Um, it can give insights into the quality of um, the evidence upon which we're making decisions. And I mentioned earlier, it doesn't always have to be top, top high quality who counts what defines as quality, but at least to give potential users an indication that you know, the evidence may be strong, weak, mixed, inconsistent, missing um, is really important. Um, context is also really important. Um, as you can imagine, some things that may work very well in one context obviously won't necessarily work in another, even if it's the neighboring country sometimes. So we need to know uh, the lay of the evidence base and also the size. Um, and it doesn't necessarily always mean that we have to have a massive evidence base. Um, we could have um, something that looks a particular uh, intervention that has a really huge evidence base, but when you look more closely, it's only in one country or, or one particular region of the world. And, and um, obviously, and conversely, you can have a, a, a you know a total evidence base that's relatively small, but if it's focused on a particular region, then maybe you could have some confidence in, in 
making recommendations from that. Um, it brings together, obviously, from, as you would say, on multiple sources, and you can also, through the process of synthesis, have an idea about representativeness, judgments on how trustworthy the evidence base is, um, and whether it speaks to certain populations. So Anna mentioned earlier, it helps to cut through the confusion and the noise. And then finally, of course, it answers questions on not only on what works, but as I mentioned earlier, so on, on how and why, for whom and for where. Um, and so depending upon the design of the synthesis, it can also give you an idea maybe about cost effectiveness or contra um, in contrary sort of wastage of funds. It can give you an idea about the most important implementation elements. Um, so which interventions should be considered for going to scale or, or which interventions should be stopped. Um, and then just a few uh, ways that synthesis can be used. So you can use it to identify knowledge gaps um, where primary evidence or primary evaluations um, are needed, um, but also where there's a duplication of effort. Um, and you can use them to inform policy design or change or changes in practice or program design, scaling or closure. So just to give you a very quick um, few examples off the top of my head. Um, so USAID have just utilized um, an evidence gap map produced by uh, 3IE, the International Impact, um, Initiative for Impact Evaluation, to develop um, a brand new rule of law policy drawing upon an evidence gap map of that kind. It's the first of its kind um, agency initiative um, in, in justice. Um, within my own agency, UNICEF, we used um, we developed an evidence gap map on what we know globally around child well-being, mapped against our strategic plan goal areas. Interestingly here, we haven't perhaps used it internally um, as much as I would like, but it's been very influential on a global basis, and many um, agencies have used it to fundraise for um, producing their own evidence. Um, and then there's a whole series, some of you may have come across, you know, the What Works Centers. There's some really interesting examples here. Um, the Education Endowment Foundation, for example, has developed toolkits um, which are enabling teachers and school leaders um, who are making decisions about how to improve learning outcomes amongst their pupils um, to look at this and to, and to try and redesign school programs. Um, another one, the Centre for Police, they developed an evidence gap map on restorative justice about what was known globally about that. And they managed to prove that not only was this this intervention really effective in reducing uh, reoffending uh, rates and enhancing um, victim satisfaction with the criminal justice system, but it was also very cost effective um, with the reduction in the cost of reoffending outweighing the cost of the um, restorative justice intervention in the first place. And then finally, um, the Center of uh, for Homelessness have got a really interesting example. They developed a a framework, um, an evidence gap map framework on rough sleeping, rough sleeping framework in, in my own country, the UK, um, to redesign interventions to minimise rough sleeping or homelessness. And as a consequence, in, in England in 2021, um, England achieved one of the lowest rates of rough sleeping in the world, with 49% uh, fewer people sleeping out in 2017. So these aren't just abstract um, academic exercises, they really can be applied uh, to to change lives and to help deliver the SDGs. Uh, thanks very much, Auntie Yusha. Thanks, Kerry. <clears throat> I hope you can hear me. Hear me. Uh, so my name is Shiv Bakrani. I'm an evaluation uh, synthesis specialist at UNDP IEO, uh, also working uh, on the coalition. We're going to talk a little bit about the, the, the first synthesis of the Global SDG Synthesis Coalition, which was focused on the partnership pillar, which is SDG 17. Um, could you move to the next slide, please? So we're going to go a little bit against the grain here, and I believe Anna wanted to say uh, something about the partnership pillar synthesis in particular. So Anna, over to you before I carry on. No, 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 Shiv, please go ahead. That's all right. Don't worry. Okay, no problem. Um, so we're going to give a sneak peek about the partnership pillar synthesis, and uh, we are having our own webinar tomorrow um, to relaunch our synthesis report and the evidence gap map. So today is a sneak peek and hopefully provides an incentive for you all to join us in our webinar tomorrow. I believe details of that webinar are gonna be posted in the chat. So we're 
we're dangling a little little uh, carrot for you there, and we hope you can uh, join us tomorrow. But as mentioned, this first partnership, Pillar Synthesis, um, was the first one of the, the coalition. It really represents a rigorous and comprehensive analysis of the global level evidence on partnerships, looking specifically at trade, finance, technology, capacity development and systemic issues, approaches and interventions. Um, there are several outputs that came out of this synthesis. Um, uh, so we have a two pager, we have a brief, we have the full and very detailed synthesis report. And we have two evidence gap maps, which I'm going to give a sneak peek of uh, today. Um, next slide, please. So I just wanted to go a little bit um, into detail about the methodology, about how we approach the partnership pillar synthesis. And this is really to give some context about uh, building upon what Kerry said about how rigorous and comprehensive and systematic this exercise was. And then uh, to give you an idea of how the evidence gap maps that I'm going to show you are actually uh, composed. So there were four different components to the synthesis, and we included four different types of evidence. We included impact evaluations and systematic reviews. Um, those are usually found in academic databases external to the UN. These usually look at the impact and, and effectiveness of interventions on different SDG outcomes. Um, they're uh, usually quantitative, um, and this was included in the synthesis uh, as, as part of a quantitative synthesis approach. Um, we also included what we label performance and process evaluation. So these are the evaluations published by different UN agencies and also by a multilateral partners. Um, these are usually qualitative in nature, and they're really useful because they tell us about implementation and design issues. So they tell us about how and why different approaches and interventions worked. We also looked at voluntary national reviews. Um, so you'll all be familiar with VNRs, uh, and we looked at the themes in the VNR data to look at how countries were reporting on progress and to look at the sentiment of that as well. And we included SDG uh, tracker data as well, and a uh, statistical analysis was undertaken, really to look at positive uh, outliers on that. Uh, and all of this evidence was triangulated in the final synthesis to produce a series of lessons on, on what works and how and why those approaches work for achieving SDG uh, 17. Uh, next slide, please. So I wanted to talk a little bit about evidence gap maps. Carrie's already highlighted some useful examples of how evidence gap maps uh, might be used um, for, for decision making. Um, so I'll, I'll just go over some points here just to reinforce what Kerry already said. Um, so evidence gap maps are a visual representation of the existing evidence base. Uh, they identify the areas that have been well evaluated. So the areas where there's a lot of evidence and they identify the gaps as the name suggests as well. So those are the gaps uh, which uh, suggest areas that require further investigation. Um, evidence gap maps increase accessibility to the evidence base. Kerry spoke a little bit about that. Um, and we've already spoken about how they identify gaps. Um, next slide, please. So, Evidence gap maps help in terms of transparency uh, of the evidence base. They provide a clear overview of the available evidence. And really, we think that these uh, evidence gap maps are uh, can be really uh, valuable tools for policy and program decision making and formulation. So again, Kerry highlighted some really useful practical and real examples. Um, and what we're arguing is that through access to the available evidence and what works and how it works, you know, that, that, that can really feed into decision making um, and other processes around uh, program uh, formulation. And really, this is all about improving evidence informed practice. So feeding empirical evidence and evaluative evidence into our decision making processes. Okay, I'm going to try and share my screen and actually show uh, the evidence gap map. So uh, hopefully this works. We tested it out earlier and it did work. Um, and let's see. Okay. So hopefully you can see my screen. 
Um, please yes. someone nod. Thank you. I can see Anna nodding. Okay. So what I'm showing you here is the homepage of the Global SDG Synthesis Coalition website. Um, you can access the uh, partnership pillar synthesis here through going on SDG pillar syntheses. And this is the partnership pillar synthesis page and you can access all of the reports and the evidence gap maps through this page. Another easy way of accessing it is here through the resources tab and you can go straight to the evidence gap maps here. So if I click on that, you can see that we have two evidence gap maps of the partnership pillar. One is on what works to accelerate progress. And the other one we titled how partnerships work to accelerate progress. And these are two different evidence gap maps and they both include, uh, or they each include different types of evidence. So I'm gonna show you the evidence gap maps now. Someone nod if they can see the evidence gap map, please. Fantastic. Okay, so this is the what works evidence gap maps. Okay, this uh, gap map includes all of the impact evaluation evidence that was included in the synthesis. And that's why we labeled it the what works evidence gap map. So the way that this gap map is constructed, it's a matrix. And on the, uh, on the, on the vertical axis here, the blue on the side, um, you can see um, uh, all the different uh, um, intervention categories that we looked at in the synthesis. So we have finance, we have technology, we have trade, uh, and we have uh, other interventions relating to, if I just click on this, other interventions relating to capacity building and systemic issues. And then on the horizontal tab, we have the, um, the outcome categories um, that, were, that were looked at in the synthesis. So what each um, cell actually demonstrates is the amount of evidence that is available um, that looks at the impact of different interventions on different outcomes. So here you have a bubble here, and it shows that there's two evaluations that look at, uh, that evaluate the impact of mobile money interventions on digital finance outcomes. Um, there are some filters here that we can use. And actually, when I was just testing this out, I already applied a filter. So I'm going to clear the filters so you, we can see the full evidence gap map. But just going back to the filters again, you can see that we can filter the evidence by different categories. So we can look at evidence for different regions, income levels, and equity considerations as well, which relate to the leave no one behind kind of categories um, that we looked at within the synthesis. So I'm just gonna close this. So just to demonstrate, um, let's look at one of these bubbles and see what turns up. So I'm gonna look at, let's, which one shall I pick? I'm gonna look at tax reforms. Um, and I'm gonna look at the evidence for tax reforms on total tax revenue, because there's a lot of evidence there. So you can see when you hover over the bubble, there's 18 records. And if I click on that bubble, uh, it gives you a list of the evidence that's in there, the 18 um, impact evaluation studies. You can look through these, you can see the abstract, you can see all the bibliographical details, and there's a link through to the evidence as well. Um, you can also, if you take a look at the evidence gap map and you think there's a study that's relevant to the synthesis and should be included, you can submit a study as well. I'm just gonna cross over and look at the other evidence gap map, which is on how um, partnerships work to accelerate progress. So this includes the, the program and performance evaluations published by the UN and other partners. And this is a little bit different. This looks at um, different types of intervention um, by uh, partnership modalities. So on this uh, vertical axis here, you have the different partnerships modalities that we looked at in the synthesis. And the bubbles relate to the amount of evidence that exists on different intervention approaches within that partnership uh, modality. Um, so that's really it. There, there'll be more tomorrow if you want to find out more about the uh, evidence gap maps. And um, can we go back to, I should stop sharing my screen and if we can go back to the presentation, please. Stop sharing. One second.
Sorry about that. That was the yeah, last. Next slide. Yeah, next. So we're just finishing off. These are just the final slides. So here's a QR code. If you quickly want to scan that, uh, you can get through to the Global SDG Synthesis Coalition website. And uh, that's it. That's the presentation. We're happy to take questions and comments. Thank you uh, for listening. Thank you so much, Shivit, Ana Rosa, and uh, Gary for this um, for this presentation. I'm going to open the floor for questions, comments, or discussions. Um, and uh, while waiting for the questions to come up, please uh, type your questions in the chat or raise your hands um, if you want to uh, to ask them verbally. Uh, just uh, in waiting for the questions to come in, I'm going to ask my my own question. Uh, I, I find it quite interesting the work that you're doing, in particular, this idea that we do so many evaluations, right, and that this is very difficult for the audience to use and absorb. Now, I'm going to try and test your evidence gap map a little bit now. Um, if I'm interested in a particular topic, right? Say, for example, the role of private sector in um, uh, food security and nutrition. I work in FAO, right? So this is the kind of question that I'm asking. Um, how can I find, using your maps, and, and perhaps the topic is not the right one for, for the partnership map, but try and you know, find another topic. How can I find the evidence that exists on the implication of the private sector in our work in pursuit of the SDG? As you know very well, the SDG is supposed to go way beyond the public sector, right? They, they are so ambitious that um, they need all hands on deck and all energies and all funding um, available and all capacity available. Now, this is the theory. In practice, how much have we been, or how much is your evidence based, looking at their role in development and the pursuit of the SDGs? Over to you, Shivit, on this one while waiting for the questions of the audience. Sure. Yeah. So just just at the outset to say that the so the, these evidence gap maps are specific to the partnership pillar. Um, so you know, if you recall when I showed. The, the EGM, you saw that it was split up into the interventions uh, and the outcomes. So we, we came up with a framework of interventions and outcomes that were kind of like a translation of the SDG 17 targets, right? Um, so what you won't find is in these evidence gap maps specifically is information that kind of cuts across some of the different SDGs. So you won't find necessarily find uh, evidence represented in there that talks about the impact of, say, private sector or public-private sector partnerships on 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 food security, because food security is in a, in another pillar. Um, right. That that is something we're hoping to do. So one thing I should have said is that these EGMs, or well, the vision is for these EGMs to be part of an eventual tech platform where EGMs are an important part of that, and a good starting point for that would be an EGM that covers. Uh, to some extent, the global evidence base on all of the pillars and all of the SDGs, and that will develop over time. And that within that, we can sort of look at the interlinkages between different pillars. What we do have in these evidence gap maps is, for example, in the process and performance EGM, there, are, there is uh, a evidence that speaks to public-private um, partnerships across different outcomes. And in the impact evaluation gap map, there's uh, categories that speak to the impact of the private sector as well, um, such as um, uh, when we, particularly when we looked at interventions related to uh, technology. Um, but yeah, and then, and then the synthesis report itself talks about some of the trade-offs as well between SDG 17 and other pillars. So part of the synthesis was to look at how, uh, to some, some extent, how uh, interventions under SDG 17 can impact of, of, uh, on S SDGs in, in other pillars as well. So there is some coverage of that in the pillars and that will develop more as we, as we do future syntheses in, in other pillars. Yeah, thank you. Right, I'm looking at the questions coming in. Um, not much so far. Um, Anna Rosa wants to um, chip in perhaps on this question or? 
Over to you, Ana Rosa. Yes, thank you, Olivier. Thank you, Shiv and, and Carrie for the presentation and, and starting on this Q&A part. Um, Olivier, you mentioned a very key question there, you know, uh, regardless of how uh, how much uh, uh, information do we have in the EGM specifically about private sector and food security? Private sector is one of the cross-cutting aspects of the SDGs, mm -hmm. um, together with the land OB and uh, you know universality. There, there are certain principles there that are key. So it is one of the aspects that cannot be ignored in any of the synthesis that we do, regardless of the scope, uh, there are certain things that need to be covered, such as you know gender, or at least LNLB at a broader level. Uh, um, private sector is another one. Universality, the sustainability component of you know the economic and environment, uh, social progression. Th those things are key, and they are looked at it uh, across the different pillars and the different synthesis that cover smaller aspects of each pillar, right? The living synthesis. Um, so what we hope to do is in the, this is the first two EGMs, you know, gap maps. We hope that in every synthesis that we produce, there will be another gap map or it will be added to this one. And you will have to look at private sector, for example. So there, there's a very interesting aspect of intersectionality there and some key principles of intersectionality related to SDGs and private sector is one, absolutely, you know, and, and I really uh, encourage everybody watching to take a look at least at the brief of the report you know, reports are long and boring and difficult to read, <laughs> but we have these briefs. Uh, it's a 10 page document that really identifies some very interesting aspects, not just the insights and the lessons, which of course you get from the report in more detail, but it really talks about, you know, who should be at the table uh, in thinking of synthesis and delivering evidence and, in, uh, and informing the uptake of the lessons that are produced. And there is the private sector too, you know, and, and how is innovation moving on, on uh, promoting partnerships? Private sector is there too. So this is just an example. Of course, we were testing the EGM and you gave us just a wonderful example to to keep elaborating on, but there are many of these principles that need to be there. And I think it's important for this particular network to be thinking of what are the key principles that need to be reminded in integrative policy. Because very often we see, for example, leaving no one behind, worse yet, reaching the furthest behind uh, first, uh, completely ignored in many of the integrated policy making gotcha. and that we see out there. So it is nice that we identify some of these um, gaps so we can then study how to improve it. So thank you for your question. This was quite quite uh, uh, useful. Yes, must, I see there's must, some must, hands up there. There is indeed, um, I think, uh, Mrs. or Mr. Kitty, I don't know, from UNFPA has a question. Thank you, Olivier. It's actually Dr. Kiki, and I'm female. I'm from UNFPA, and uh, one of the founding members of our IPPN network. Thank you very much for this really interesting um, presentation and um, this tool that you have, this work that you've put together. I think there's a lot of value here, and I'm keen to sort of understand it a bit more. I was provoked by the question that you, Olivier, had asked, and the response and and I think one thing that is a little bit challenging is how to use um this um SDG synthesis work because I'm not really sure what questions it is able to answer. However, I'm going to localize my question to targets that I know sit within SDG 17. So specifically for example on data so that would be target 17.18 and 17.19. What sort of information can I get or can I derive from this SDG synthesis work 
on the extent to which um, statistical capacity has been built at national level for um, measuring and tracking the SDGs and what are some of the trends and or best practices that you've been able to derive or analyze um, from the evaluative studies and from this work. So that's really, the, that's the core question. Then I love what the prior speaker, I missed her name, what the prior speaker was just saying about principles and having some principles of both the 2030 agenda and you know the kind of development work we do writ large, having those core principles underpin integrated SDG approaches. I think this is so critical. We were having a meeting yesterday and we were just talking exactly about this point. And so I'm, I'm very happy to hear it um, echoed. And I want to know the extent to which this was accounted for. Those principles rightly would include a human rights-based approach, LNOB, gender equality, um, reaching the furthest behind first, were these taken into account as this work was being conducted or are these more sort of future focused um work that you would you would incorporate in the next iteration so again two core questions one on the principles but another one more concretely on what you've seen as pertains to sdgs 17.18 and 17.19 which are the two targets that are focused on data within Goal 17 within that partnerships remit. Over. You're muted. Sorry. Who wants to take the first question on the data, the more the more technical question, if you wish? And, and who wants to take the next question on the principles? I suppose on the Rosa for the principles. Um, uh, unless my colleagues want to take, I, I can speak to both actually, and then perhaps they can come in. Um, Dr. Kiki, thank you so much for your question. Um, it, I have to tell you, it was one of the most heated discussions as we were trying to come up with the scope uh, mm -hmm. for, for the synthesis because we had limited resources and time. We wanted to uh, delivered this synthesis to the SDG summit in past September. So we were in a rush to narrow the scope and produce something that was compelling enough to still get to the to the uh, General Assembly and the SDG summit with something, right? And it, we decided SDG 17 has, has five specific aspects that are key that we kind of group them around there. Uh, finance, trade, technology, capacity development, systemic issues, right? And within, we had to narrow the scope to, to three. So trade, finance, and technology. And statistical capacity data wasn't around there. And we said, no way, we, we cannot leave this one out. So this was one particular issue where we, we pulled in to the scope, but I have to admit, I still find that it was very shallow the way we were able to cover because we were so rushed and limited in in, in ability to go deep into the uh, the evaluations that were out there talking about it. But yes, we still were able to identify what we all know it's a, a general and obvious uh, uh, answer, which is statistical capacity has improved but way below uh, the necessity that we have to, to really push there. So on that aspect, and perhaps Shiv and Carrie can, can come in as well and talk more about it. But uh, of course, what, all we were able to present was the obvious, which is what we really want to try to avoid in the synthesis, although it's very difficult. It become, the bigger the synthesis, the more generic the messages. That's why we decided now to narrow the scope and go deeper. But it is an important component. So what we were able to say is something generic. But on the principles, absolutely. It's it's uh, mandatory across all pillars. That's something that the coalition has agreed that we will uphold some key aspects across the board to the extent possible. And, and it is difficult because it really forces us to um, to to dig. And some of these aspects, they're big evidence gaps. It's not there. And as you know, gender is one that it's 
horrible. The, the amount of information, there's a lot of information, but the information that is there is showing no progress or limited progress or, or a pitiful situation. And it's the same with leaving the one behind, reaching the furthest behind first. But important aspect is we are covering, we are identifying these gaps and hopefully it will help us do more evaluations to identify what works and how do we improve the situation? But we need to rush. To, There's not much time. Thank I'm you. I'm going to to call on Gary also on the on the question on the principles, um, in the spirit of you know cross agency uh, collaboration. Gary, uh, what was your feel and your sense on the utility of using those principles as um, viables, if you wish, on any synthesis or evidence gap map or or any such work? I mean, I think where where Anna um, ended up was was very true. We had a, the initial idea for the coalition. Well, two twofold. One was that evaluative evidence evaluations um, just weren't being used enough, and it was this sort of hidden treasure trove. So that was what we wanted to bring uh, up to the forefront, alongside multiple other forms of evidence. And I think that's that's really important for for Dr. Kiki's question that. We're not saying that evaluation has all of the answers. There are multiple other data monitoring, BNR monitoring, research pieces as well. It's about bringing all of it together somehow. And the other thing was around the, the scope. So we had originally wanted to do um, syntheses per pillar, so five living syntheses. And as Anna mentioned, this is um, something that we learned a lot from the partnerships one, that um, when you have such a massive starting point, what what works in terms of partnerships and then you have all of these valuations you can't always necessarily get down into the the detailed recommendations that you would like um but if you had a sort of narrow a narrow scope so um hence the idea to sort of to to try and have this suite of 100 living syntheses that all embed these common core principles um but then we have to find a way of allowing for flexibility in design of each of them, but also allowing them uh, to be able to aggregate upwards to have some sort of um, uh, interface that enables potential users to really answer the questions that they individually have. So um, this first one, I mean, a lot of the evidence around what works in partnerships is at the macro level anyway. Um, there's very little evaluative evidence that goes narrow, and I hope I'm not giving away the, the key takeaways for tomorrow's um, uh, webinar, but um, so I think it 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 has varied. Um, and then one other thing that doesn't particularly answer the question on principles that I think is is really important is that it's not just about producing reports or even living reports or living databases. There are other sorts of um, things that we're trying to do as we think about expanding the coalition and broadening the coalition. So there are some really excellent. Uh, initiatives out there that the the research world, the Campbells, the Cochrans, etc., working on a lot of research synthesis. There's the Global Evidence Commission that is looking at, at system strengthening. There's um, uh, Alive, which is looking at AI, machine learning for, for you know all of these different sorts of things. And we need to try and uh, even beyond the coalition, think holistically and and you know, think about what role that evaluation can play within that much much broader ecosystem. If we really want to see something that's transformative um, at this stage in terms of delivering the SDGs. Um, so, so active brokering, active engagement discussion, rather than just expecting somebody to read a paper or interface with a, a very good tool um, with an EGM, but still just a tool is um, and the starting point. So uh, that's another key principle for me um, is the whole principle of user engagement, putting the user first. Thanks. Thank you, Kerry. Um... I don't Sorry, could I come in, Olivia? Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I can't, I can't seem to raise my hand for some reason. So, yeah, I, th I think I think that's a really um, insightful question, actually, because you've picked up on statistical capacity building and Anna spoke to that. And I mean, th I, this might be a controversial answer. It's not, a, it's not us trying to get out of it, but we found actually surprisingly limited evidence, limited evaluative evidence that looks at statistical capacity building interventions. Even when we went to... The um, what do you call them? The the um, the the agency responsible for the indicators. We we found few totally evaluations as well. Um, yeah, exactly. So that's an interesting 
uh, finding in and of itself. And you can see that in the evidence gap maps as a gap. Uh, so, you know, that's one way the evidence gap maps are already useful there. If you come to the webinar tomorrow, you'll see that we'll talk about some of the findings and lessons from the capacity building uh, component of the synthesis that speak to or around some of what you're, uh, Kiki, uh, Dr. Kiki, what you were asking, but also around the, how countries approach developing VNRs and the capacity building issues and statistical capacity issues around those and issues around including more kind of evaluative evidence in those VNRs. So again, I'm dangling a carrot there for tomorrow. Um, we'll say a bit more about it. In terms of the principles, uh, yes, they're, they're hard wide into this, the coalition. And the, the only other thing that I want to add to what Carrie and Anna have said is we can oper operationalize those principles by actually looking at different findings for different groups or how interventions go, for example, to reach the furthest behind. And those are hard wide into the forthcoming syntheses as well. So you'll see more of that. Thank you. Uh, if I may share a little piece of my own personal uh, experience on the principles, when uh, we embarked on a series of SDG evaluations in FAO, we made the conscious decision to have, uh, to use the principles as a grid of analysis for every work that we would look at. And um, we discovered in the end that this was really the most powerful piece of the SDG puzzle, so to speak, because it's it's about the philosophy, the way, the approach, uh, uh, what's important for us, the values. It's not about particular targets, right? And if you use the principles in your evaluations as a variable, you will see that you will find, I mean, in our experience, you we got a lot of energy and a lot of passion and a lot of pushback sometimes on this. So this is, in my view, where a lot of the energy of the SDGs uh, resides. I think we have to wrap up now. Uh, we're coming to an end of this session. Uh, if you could, uh, I think you've uh, done a lot of advertisement for two sessions, so that's that's good enough. Can I uh, perhaps uh, ask a last question? Is to try and, and make it useful for the country level. Now, I understand what you're saying, you know, a synthesis at the end uh, will tend to arrive at messages that are very, very uh, 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 broad and somehow, sometimes a little bit known already or, or intuited already. And uh, not to say that they are cliches, but they are not necessarily shockers, right? And I understand that. I understand also that a synthesis won't have much detail or granularity at the local level. But I want to flag that with the UN reform, decisions now are being taken at country level more and more, that um, the UN is supposed to bring together its analytical capacity in, 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 in one go, in one document, uh, doing a country assessment of the challenges. And therefore, that all the work that you've been doing would, in my view, be quite useful for those UN country teams. Now, it sort of... Uh, rest on whether or not you have enough granularity, right? Whether or not you, you have included uh, national studies and a large number of them in your input. Can you say a quick word of that, either Anarosa or Shivit, before we, we leave? How can this work trickle down to the country level and help country teams? Thank you, Olivia. It's been super quick, so my other colleagues can come in as well. Uh, there are two ways that we're hoping to, to be able to advance on this. Um, uh, one is, of course, the evidence gap maps. The fact that you can go in there and click on those bubbles and, and search for what is your need on the particular context, it may help to get started. But we want to go much beyond. We want to be able to produce something such as what we have for AIDA. In AIDA, if you go in there and you type private sector and food security and ask what are the key insights, you will get the key insights literally written in the form of a lesson uh, for a particular region or particular country based on the plus 6,000 evaluations that we have there. The problem is AIDA only has UNDP evaluations. What we want to be able to do is have an AI that ingests all UNICEF evaluations, all the other evaluations around, so it, we can be able to spit out a quick report or a couple of, of, of insights 
that are more contextualized to a particular country or even a particular region within a country, depending on the evidence that is available. So we need to work with AI and that is in the future, unfortunately. The other aspect is really taking these reports, taking these EGMs and starting a conversation at country level. And we do have some champions like Panama and Lithuania that have started a conversation in their regions to take this report and go deeper into their context and then look into the analysis, look into the evidence that is available in their countries, in their regions, and then further contextualize what we did. So this is beyond our evaluation office mandate, unfortunately, because it's, it becomes programming work, but at least it is inspiration for them to take it fro forward from there. Yes. Shiv? Yeah, just building on what Anna said. So the vision, hopefully, is that we make this global evidence base available for all the pillars, right? It's there. It's in the form of gap maps. It's in the form of ways that people can play with it that can be ingested by AI. And, you know, the coalition can't do everything, you know, the, what we can do to, which is a major added value in and of itself is, is do these global level syntheses and, and collate the evidence base systematically and make it open and available for others to cut and play with. So if they want to take the evidence base at a country or regional level for a particular SDG or intervention or outcome then hopefully that, that that's the vision the other thing i just wanted to mention is that we can do like maybe not for the coalition but the UNDP IEO, for example is doing these synthesis at a regional level with regional bureaus to look at the evidence base specific to regions and maybe i can plug um some previous work that i did uh, when i was at unicef so we did a global level synthesis for example on family policies and from that that was used to make country level briefs so looking at that evidence base, looking what's comparable, say, for example, China, which what, what evidence is comparable to China using different indicators and including that in a, in a brief that pulls from that global level evidence base for specific countries. So there's different ways we can play around with this, this collation uh, that we're doing. Thanks. Yeah, I can see how this could be very, very useful. Um, OK, so please check the box for all the links to all these um, great resources and um, we uh, will see you hopefully tomorrow for um, a, a longer more detailed presentation now I have to bring this presentation and and uh, webinar to a close so um, first of all let me ask uh, let me thank Serge and Nadine from the IPPN organizing team for the excellent support and, uh, and and work today. Thank you, of course, the presenters, uh, Carrie, Anna Rosa, and Shivit, uh, for those uh, very useful presentations. I think you would all agree. And um, I, I would uh, invite you to continue uh, joining the IPPN. Uh, the next uh, uh, iteration will be on 13th of March. So please uh, jot that down on your calendars. We will then discuss the uh, importance of capacity development as a lever to accelerate the 2030 agenda. And this will be with co-authors of the 2023 Global Sustainable Development Report. Um, with this, I think uh, um, just to wish you a good rest of the day and thank you all for your attention and participation today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.